So today I'm going to focus on mechanisms of axonal growth inhibition in the CNS and I'm going to focus on the optic nerve which is a CNS you know um, component where axons usually when you transect them do not grow spontaneously and so we use this as a model to basically find you know tricks or tools that will actually make these axons grow and the more and the longer they grow, the happier we are. So kind of as an introduction, so the significance of my work is relatively easy to justify because it has been known since, you know, by the old uh, ancient Greek doctors that spinal cord injury cannot repair itself spontaneously. And the sad statement here is that once a person has acquired a spinal cord injury, they're pretty much destined to die because there's no cure and you don't live very long with a spinal cord injury, at least you know, a few thousand years ago. So nowadays, things have changed to the better. So people survive many times for like decades following spinal cord injury. Here with Christopher Reeve, for instance, with a cervical spinal cord injury. And many patients who are spinal cord injury usually acquire a spinal cord injury at a fairly young age. And so they can live, depending on the location of the spinal cord injury, 20 or 30 years, so which is a great achievement of modern medicine. But something modern medicine cannot do is basically fix this lesion here. You see here a spinal cord which has been crushed here and basically fibers which go from the brain descend down here to the spinal cord are transected and sensory ascending fibers are transected and so you get these huge functional deficits, one of which is lack of motor coordination or any sort of limb movement, but there's many, many more complications. Actually, if you speak to spinal cord injury papers, there's uh, patients that's the, you know, the lack or inability to move or walk, that's, that's one of, of, of several concerns they have. So new treatment strategies to actually you know, lower the burdens of this problem are still urgently needed. And so the focus of my lab is basically to understand why do these axons here not spontaneously repair themselves because the cell bodies of the neurons usually sit up here in the brain or somewhere here in sensory ganglia far away from the injury site. So they survive for years, for decades, a lifelong, but they will never reconnect and restore function. <coughs> so what's going on? So this is a, a picture that I borrowed from a review, from a recent review from a Shigong Hills lab where he basically um, shows an injury site in the spinal cord and you can see here there's lots of fibers which are going up and down the spinal cord in black and you see here myelinating glia which will be the oligodendrocytes in the spinal cord and they basically wrap themselves here around the axons and that's a good thing because if you have myelination you can actually get very fast and rapid uh, propagation of action potential so that makes you respond very fast if you want to. Um, a bad thing is these myelin inhibitor, these myelin sheets, once there's an injury, actually degenerate and basically degrade and they release a lot of factors or proteins and many of these proteins have been isolated and shown to actually be profoundly inhibitory for regenerating axons and so this is pioneering work from Martin Schwab and Steven Straitmatter on Naogo, Murray Philbin on MAG and Shi Gang He on OMGP. So these molecules have been around for a while and, and we know that they do inhibit outgrowth. You can take them out, plate them on a petri dish, throw neurons on it and these neurons will not even sit on it at the high concentration. At the low concentration will sit on these substrates but they will not make any axons. There's no growth. Also more recent work has shown that many of the classic or prototypic axon guidance molecules such as the semaphorins, the efferins, the nephrins, the slits and so on, they're still present in the mature spinal cord. These are axon guidance molecules and they certainly do not help guide axons here in the mature spinal cord but what they still can do is inhibit growth and they probably contribute to the growth inhibitory environment of the injured adult mammalian CNS and so that's kind of 
these are the traffic stop signs that are certainly present <coughs> in the injured spinal cord, but that's only a fraction of the story. There's much more going on that I'm not going to go into uh, excitotoxicity and contribution from the immune system and so on, but I will talk about another class of inhibitors which most of you are probably familiar with because of the work of uh, Jerry Silver here. Um, so around the injury site, after a few days, a glial scar develops. And so this glial scar is made mainly out of reactive astrocytes, and reactive astrocytes produce uh, very prominently chondritin sulfate proteoglycans, which are molecules which have a protein core and lots of glycans in the glycan sugar chains, and they actually are profoundly inhibitory for regenerating axons as well. So there are these two camps. There's like the myelin, obviously, camp, which probably has good arguments by having all these molecules to show, which each of which is profoundly inhibitory. But then you have the glial scar with all these chondrin sulfate proteoglycans, which are very inhibitory towards regenerating axons. So this is most likely a situation where you have multiple play bad players uh, from different origin. But they all contribute eventually to the fact that these axons cannot regrow and basically restore function. So there's a, this is a big advancement in the field was actually going from the observation that a CNS injury does not repair itself spontaneously, but actually identifying some of the factors that might contribute to this lack of spontaneous repair. And so that obviously brings us to the molecules. And so there's a lot of inhibitors, and there's a growing number of receptors for these inhibitors. And just to briefly introduce them, so myelin-associated glycoprotein is this uh, IG-type uh, surface molecule only expressed by myelinating glia. It uh, is composed of five immunoglobulin-like domains. Then you have a, a very interesting molecule, which is NOGO-A, which is a reticulon and has a multiple membrane-spanning domains. It can have different topologies. So sometimes this amino, amino NOGO or N-terminal fragment of NOGO is outside of the cell and sometimes it's inside the cell, depending at the context in which you look at this protein. What we do know is that NOGO has at least two inhibitory you know, fragments or portions. So it's amino NOGO and NOGO 66. And so this NOGO 66 domain actually can signal um, inhibition or growth cone collapse through interaction with the NOGO receptor 1. We do not know how the inhibition of amino NOGO is communicated to neurons or growth cones because no receptor has yet been identified. So there's still a lot of interesting things to be discovered. What is interesting is that the NOGO 66 receptor, first discovered by Stephen Stripmatter more than 10 years ago, was later shown to actually also bind MAG and OMGP, two other potent inhibitors of outgrowth. So it's kind of interesting that structurally very distinct inhibitors in CNS myelin seem to talk to one and the same receptor, which is this beast here, which is called the NOGO receptor 1. And so the NOGO receptor 1 is part of a complex with a membrane-spanning protein such as Lingo 1 and P75 or Troy. And so the NOGO receptor is GPI anchored or lipid linked to the surface, so it cannot signal itself to the neuron. So it needs membrane-spanning proteins to actually activate downstream signaling cascades, such as activation of Rho and PKC and so on, that eventually lead to the breakdown of the cytoskeleton. In addition, um, work from Mark Tessilovinia's lab has identified about three years ago a novel <coughs> receptor for each of these three inhibitors, MAG, NOGO66, and OMGP, which is called PIRB, which is actually uh, a molecule which has been well known in the immune system uh, in regulating B cell function, but it's also expressed in the nervous system and it contributes to growth inhibition by binding to these ligands. So if you really want to like go ahead and kind of prove that these molecules are important for growth inhibition or that these are the receptors used by these inhibitors to block regeneration, um, you have to basically use in vitro and in vivo functional assays. But the problem you're going to face is that there's a great degree of redundancy. As you can see, there's multiple ligands and there's multiple receptors. <coughs> 
And so work from John Flanagan's lab and also uh, together with Jerry Silver has basically identified a few years ago the first receptors for chondrin sulfate proteoglycan. Proteoglycans, um, it is the uh, receptor protein tyrosine phosphatase sigma, which is basically this receptor phosphatase with this huge extracellular domain, which at its end terminal portion can bind to the sugar portion of these chondrin sulfate proteoglycans and signal growth inhibition. So, this is one mechanism. Additional mechanisms, as I've just said. We have MAG, NOGO, and OMGP. They can both bind to the NOGO receptor 1 complex and to the PIRB complex. So there's redundancy here in these receptors, and there's multiple ligands. So probably if you lose one of these ligands, the other ones will be sufficient to tell the neurons not to grow. So that's a problem. Redundancy is obviously a problem if you use genetic approaches where you knock out individual components and then ask the system, is there more regeneration or not? A few years ago, we showed that MAG binds with very high affinity to the NOGO receptor 2, and no ligands for the NOGO receptor 3, at least no inhibitory or functional ligands for NOGO receptor 3, sorry, have been identified so far. So now I'm going to focus on MAG, NOGO, and OMGP. And so basically, use a mouse genetic approach to ask are these molecules really important for neuronal growth inhibition, both in vitro and in vivo? And the problem we're facing is that we have multiple inhibitors and multiple receptors for these inhibitors. And if you use a mouse genetic approach, you have to basically use compound mutant mice. So mice which lack multiple inhibitors and best mice which lack multiple receptors. So there's a lot of mouse work. And we were fortunate that we actually got mice from collaborators, so the NGR1 null mouse we got from Mark Tessilvinia, the NGR2 mouse we made ourselves, and the NGR3 mouse we got from Mike Greenberg. And so we did a lot of crossing and eventually got triple mutant mice. We showed that these mice indeed carry all the you know, mutations as predicted and showed by Western blot if you use brain tissue from these mice, the wild type mice have the NOGO receptor 1, 2, and 3 but the mutant mice do not have these receptors. And so the, one of the most amazing things is when I, when I saw these triple knockout mice, they're completely healthy. They look normal, they breathe, they eat, they're happy. And you wouldn't be able to tell them apart from the wild type controls. So the NOGO receptors certainly seem not to be essential for life and not for development which obviously asks the whole new questions, what are these receptors good for? Because one thing we know for sure, we don't have these receptors, which in fact every one of us in here has, for uh, blocking regeneration following spinal cord injury. So they must have a physiological function, which is something we're very much interested in, in understanding what are these proteins good for. And they're expressed strongly in the brain, they're expressed in excitatory neurons, they're enriched at synapses, and so we're very interested in exploring the possibility that they actually regulate physiological forms of uh, synaptic plasticity. But so back to the <coughs> regeneration questions that I raised earlier, which is to basically understand if you take neurons and different types of neurons from mice which are null for either the NOGO receptor alone, for the NOGO receptor 1 and 2, for the NOGO receptor 3, or the NOGO receptor 1, 2, and 3, you can actually start to ask, do these neurons grow better? On the control substrate, which we have shown here, they do not. So if you have your neurite outgrowth in micrometers, it doesn't really matter whether you lose one or several of these NOGO receptors, they all grow really well. So there's not like an endogenously changed uh, growth behavior. But if you throw these neurons on central nervous system myelin, which we isolate from wild type mice, then you can immediately see that wild type neurons do not like myelin. Even at very low doses of myelin, axons or these processes will no longer extend. So myelin does inhibit neurite outgrowth. And so we showed a few years ago that if you just lose the NOGO receptor 1, you still do not get longer axons. What you actually can achieve by losing the NOGO receptor 1 is you get less growth cone collapse, which is a very acute response of these neurons to inhibitors. But on chronic substrate-bound 
inhibitors, in outgrowth assays, losing the NOGO receptor one is not good enough to actually give you more neurite lengths. And even if you knock out the NOGO receptor one and two, which is basically both MAG receptors and NGA1, which binds to NOGO 66 and OMGP, you still do not get any more neurite outgrowth. And the same is true for NGR3. And all these slides are up here because something interesting happens. If you knock out one, two, and three of the NOGO receptors, you get more neurite outgrowth as shown here. So this is on myelin, wild type, NGR1 single null, NGR1 two double nulls, NGR3. And you see here, this is a significant increase here between the one, two null and the triple null. So that suggests that if you lose all three receptors, something is no longer inhibitory towards these neurons. And because NOGO receptors bind very strongly to myelin inhibitors, that was my previous slide, which is so, oh, there's probably some other myelin inhibitors in there which belong to some fragments of MAG or NOGO or OMGP, which we haven't been discovering before because we haven't looked at all the domains of these ligands and receptors. And so the easiest way for us to test that was to obtain mice from Benhai Sang, which are deficient for all three ligands. So remember, you have these three ligands. So these mice lack each of these three ligands. So if the release of inhibition in the triple null mutants for NOGO receptor two, three, and one is because something here is no longer inhibiting, then this effect obviously should be gone if you use NOGO receptor triple null neurons and plate them on NOGO, MAG, OMGP deficient myelin. I hope this makes sense. So basically we have myelin which has no inhibitors and we have neurons which lack all three known receptors for myelin. And so then we ask, so what happens? And so what's happening is that as predicted and shown by uh, Ben Hai Sang and Steven Stripmatter, if you use myelin, which is deficient for these three main inhibitors, you actually get longer neurite outgrowth, even in wild type neurons, because there's less inhibition. You have taken out three important inhibitors. But then if you do this experiment with the NOGO receptor triple null neurons, you still get significantly more neurite outgrowth than with the NOGO receptor one, two single null. So there's something else in these myelin substrates, which is different than NOGO, MAG, and OMGP, which signals inhibition through the NOGO receptors one, two, and three. I hope I've confused everybody by now. But so the bottom line is we take out all the inhibitors which we know in myelin, which are signaling through the NOGO receptors. And then we knock out all three receptors and we still get more growth, so there must be something else in myelin which still signals through these receptors. And so we kind of, then we're asking, what is this something else? It's basically a fishing expedition for new ligands of these NOGO receptors because we have a foundation to explain. There must be another inhibitory mechanism in there. So we took kind of an unconventional kind of approach where we basically guessed, can we find any known inhibitor that is actually binding to NGR1 or NGR2 or NGR3 that's present in brain tissue sections and then basically ask, is this binding still preserved if you use tissue from mice which lack the corresponding inhibitor? So the prediction is if you knock out all the ligands for NGR1, like NOGO, MAG, and OMGP, and the tall stone soluble NOGO receptor 1, it should no longer bind to brain tissue section because the ligands are gone unless there's another ligand in there. And indeed, there's another ligand in there. Because we still get binding of soluble NOGO receptor 1 to tissue which has no NOGO, no OMGP, and no MAG. And so this is true for NGO1, and that's true for NGO3. And also, there's no homophilic interaction between these receptors. So if you use the triple null neuron brain tissue, like triple, triple receptor knockout brain tissue, it still can bind the soluble receptors. That means the soluble receptor binds to something in these tissues which is not NOGO receptor related or not inhibitor related. 
So we have now a case or something in there. And then we did a few simple experiments. We basically ask, is this binding heat sensitive, which will suggest it's a protein? Because usually if we heat up these sections and it's a protein, it can denature and then the binding is gone. And we also ask, can it be destroyed by trypsin? Again, if it's a protein, you treat the sections with trypsin, you expect that the binding will be gone. And so we did that, and neither heat nor trypsin treatment had any impact on the binding. So we knew it's probably not a protein that supports the binding. So we're talking here about a lipid or a sugar or, or, or a combination thereof. And so once we knew that, we basically went in there with a whole slew of different glycosidases, which you probably can't read, but that's not important. So basically you can chop off different sugars. Like uh, you can uh, chop off all N-terminal linked sugars. You can chop off certain types of O-linked sugars. And we can remove terminal sialic acids. But what really worked, if you started to treat these sections with heparinase or pretreated uh, them with chondroitinase ABC, we started to see that this binding is becoming weaker. And what also worked very well is if we pre-incubate our ligands with heparin, we basically can soak up the binding sites and get no longer binding to brain tissue sections. So there must be something in there which is a proteoglycan which supports <coughs> binding of the soluble NOGO receptors. Questions so far? So then, we kind of were interested in finding out, can we actually pinpoint <coughs> within the NOGO receptor ectodomain, which is shown here, which has this leucine-rich repeat domains and this stalk region and the GPI anchor, where the binding site is for this interaction with brain tissue sections. And so we used soluble NOGO receptor one, soluble NOGO receptor two, or three, and washed it onto brain tissue sections and what we found is that only the NOGO receptor 1 and 3 bound to brain, but not NOGO receptor 2. And these are embryonic brain tissue sections before myelination starts. So we have something in the brain that specifically interacts with NGR1 and NGR3, but not with NGR2. So that's kind of nature has made an experiment here. Obviously, this receptor, which looks very similar, has mutated some sequences which are important for binding here. And so, to make a long story short, we're actually able to use deletion fragments of the NOGO receptor 1 and NOGO receptor 3 and pinpoint which sequences in the receptor are important for binding the brain. And so, the MAG, NOGO, and OMGP binding site of NGO1 is located here in the leucine rich repeat. And this fraction, or this, this <coughs> fragment of the receptor does not bind the brain by itself, so there's no binding. But it's this non-myelin inhibitory binding fragment, which is actually sufficient to give 100% binding similar to the full length receptor. So we knew something here in this portion of the receptor is important to bind to brain. And so then we made a lot of deletion mutants, and so what we actually found that there's a, two clusters of basic amino acids which are highly conserved from uh, fish to humans in all NOGO receptors here in the chick, the mouse, the rat, the human, which we call motif one and motif two, which are absolutely essential for binding to brain. And interestingly, these same motifs are conserved in the NOGO receptor three, and they're totally missing in NOGO receptor two, which is the receptor which does not bind to brain tissue section. So we have found the molecular reasons for why NGR2 does not bind to brain. And we have identified the sequences in NGR1 and 3 that are important for binding to brain. And indeed, if you, if you delete these sequences here, we totally lose the binding. So this is the full length NGR1, the full length NGR3, delete motif 2, no binding, delete motif 2 totally no binding of NGR3. So we're very confident that we have nailed down which sequences in these receptors are important for binding to brain. And so what is interesting, if you go into the literature, that these positively charged stretches of amino acids are actually found in proteins that can bind to proteoglycans. And so one interesting class of proteoglycans that can inhibit neuronal growth are the chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. 
And so we developed the idea that maybe the no-go receptors bind actually through these basic amino acid residues to chondritin sulfate proteic ligands. And so we wanted to test that. And so the way we tested that is by first showing that the no-go receptor one binds indeed strongly to control brain tissue sections. It's sensitive to heparinase treatment early in development, somewhat less sensitive to chondritin sulfate, uh, chase ABC treatment at the early developmental stages. But then if you actually go in there and start to ask what type of sugars can we actually use to compete this binding out, we see it's a very, very specific subset of uh, chondritin sulfate glycosaminoglycans, which is important for binding. So if you use chondritin sulfate A, which basically has a specific sulfation pattern here along these sugars, we cannot compete the binding out of Nogo receptor 1 or Nogo receptor 3. If you use chondritin sulfate B, which has a different sulfation pattern, it shows partial blocking of binding in the presence of this sugar. Chondritin sulfate C has no effect, but interestingly, chondritin sulfate D and E are very potent blockers of this interaction. That means that these sugars bind to the Nogo receptors and block the binding to probably the same structures on brain tissue sections. So we have identified a novel interaction between no-go receptors and specific glycosaminoglycan side chains um, of chondritin sulfate proteoglycans to then directly show that actually these receptors do bind to these different types of sugars. We collaborated with uh, Herb Geller at the NIH, and he basically developed a sandwich ELISA assay where he presents the sugar uh, on an ELISA plate at increasing concentration, and we ask how much absorption of tagged NOGO receptor we get if you incubate to this particular sugar. And you see the NOGO receptor 1 does not bind to chondritin sulfate A. It binds well to chondritin sulfate B, very weakly to chondritin sulfate C, strongly to chondritin sulfate D and E, which is consistent that these types of CSKX can compete for the binding to brain tissue section. So this is evidence that indeed the NOGO receptors bind directly and with high affinity to these specific glycosaminoglycan side chains of chondritin sulfate proteoglycans. And what is interesting, if you compare the binding of NGR1, which is shown here again in the sandwich ELISA, as we basically have the GAGs presented here, and then ask how much of the soluble receptor does bind. If you do this binding assay in the presence of increasing concentration of a receptor which has previously been identified, which is the RTPT sigma receptor, it actually competes out the binding of NG1 to chondritin sulfate E. So chondritin sulfate E is an important chondritin sulfate proteoglycan, glycan which is contributing heavily to the growth inhibitory activity of CSPGs and is a receptor for, is a ligand for the receptor um, RTPT sigma. And it now turns out that the NOGO receptor 1 and RTPT sigma actually share the same inhibitory epitope on CSKX. So CSC seems to be the main player. They're both bind by the NOGO receptor 1 and the NOGO receptor 2, but they're also bound by the previously identified receptor RTPT sigma. <coughs> And so this is the competition binding curve. And again, if you make a chimeric NOGO receptor, this is a reviewer asked us to do that, where we replace the NGR1 sequences, which are important for GAG binding, by the corresponding sequences of NGR2, which do not bind to GAGs, we lose the bindings as predicted, <coughs> because NGR2 does not bind to glycans and the glycans. So again, to recap, we have found very specific interactions of NGR1 and NGR3 but not NGR2, we counted in sulfate E and D, and these interactions seem to be shared with the previously identified receptors, RTPT sigma. So obviously that's all biochemistry, so we have to do better than that and basically ask what's the functional significance of these interactions. And an easy experiment for us to do was to basically ask, can we use soluble NOGO receptor 1, which has the glycosaminoglycan binding site, and in, add it to outgrowth inhibition assays on chondritin sulfate proteoglycans, 
And if there is a direct binding between these soluble receptors and the inhibitory substrate, if you add high doses of the soluble receptor, it will bind to the inhibitory substrate, mask it, and basically promote neurad outgrowth. And so that's exactly what happens. So if you have no proteoglycans in our in vitro neurad outgrowth assays, you get long neurites in the presence of a control IgG. You get long neurites in the presence of soluble nogal receptor 1. We have a, a soluble nogal receptor 1 point mutation, which only lacks the amino acids, which are important for the gag binding of chondrin sulfate proteoglycans. You also get long neurites. And this is the soluble form of the receptor protein tyrosine phosphatase sigma, the previously identified CSPG receptor. Also, does not affect neurite outgrowth. Then, if you add CSPGs, which are inhibitory, as you can see here, in the presence of IgG, inhibition is still very strong. It's more than 50 percent, so that's, that's potent inhibition. This can be overcome in the presence of a soluble NOGO receptor 1 in a dose-dependent manner. So we haven't shown the dose, but we can basically override the inhibition. We cannot override the inhibition if you have a receptor which lacks the GAC binding site. So basically, you need the glycosome and the glycan binding site on the soluble receptor to override the CSPG inhibition, because this receptor cannot bind to the sugar structure. And this is our positive control. RTPT sigma binds the sugars, and if you add it at high concentration, it totally neutralizes the CSPG inhibitory activity. So that's the first evidence that these receptors probably bind in soluble form to inhibitory substrates or structures on glycosome and glycans, and if you add them to a culture system, they can release neurad outgrowth inhibition. Okay, so this is kind of indirect. So we kind of wanted to have a more direct assay to ask what's the functional consequence of these NOGO receptor CSPG interactions. And so what we did, we used neurons, neurons which we have uh, used for our initial observation from mice which are deficient for NGO1, NGO1, 2, 3, or all three receptors, or RTPT segment, and ask, are these neurons which lack these select receptors for um, CSPG uh, ligands extending longer neurites on a CSPG substrate? And so the answer is yes. So all the mutant and wild type neurons, they show nice long neurite outgrowth on BSA, which is a control substrate. Then in the presence of CSPG, you get profound inhibition. There's very little neurite outgrowth. You lose an ogre receptor one, nothing really happens. One and two, little happens. Three alone, nothing really happens. But then if you start to lose NGO1, 2, and 3, you suddenly get this huge jump in your red outgrowth. So showing that if neurons are deficient for NOGO receptors, they extend much longer neurites on a CSPG substrate. That's basically demonstrating that these interactions are important for telling these neurons not to grow. So that's a functional ligand receptor interaction which inhibits new red outgrowth. And here is our control. RTPT sigma, and that has been published before. If you lose RTPT sigma, you get more neurite outgrowth on a CSVG inhibitory substrate. Any yeah. ideas about what another receptor is that could be mediating that inhibitory effect? Since we're getting partial recovery? Very good point. So the, the short answer is that you don't know, but I can speculate. And I can speculate because a recent study has shown that a very close relative of uh, RTPT sigma, which is called LAR, can actually bind CSPG and also inhibits URAD outgrowth. So it could very well be that, well, there's two answers. So I could say, well, here we still have the NOGO receptors. They maybe contribute to that type of inhibition. Here we still have the sigma receptors. So maybe if you lose sigma, then you may get you know, more URAD outgrowth. And actually have evidence that this is true. But there could still be other receptors. I mean, there's integrins which have been implicated. There's definitely LAR. So maybe a bad case scenario would be you have to lose no receptors, multiple LAR family members, and probably still other receptors to actually fully neutralize the CSPG inhibitory effects. But yeah, it's, it's partial. And I think here you could just argue they have you know, partially redundant effects, or there's still other receptors which are playing into this. Um, you know, not fully, com no, not a full release of inhibition in this assay. So this is all in vitro, which you know is good to dissect mechanisms and 
see to what extent certain ligand receptor systems contribute to growth inhibition. But we really wanted to know what's happening in vivo. And so the model we are using is basically an optic nerve crush injury in transgenic or knockout mice, which is a very simple model where we basically make a lateral incision on one eye and then basically go with fine tweezers and crush the optic nerve for a few seconds, about two millimeters behind the eye. So all the optic nerve axons, which originate from the retinal ganglion cells, will basically be transected. And in a wild type mouse, there's basically no regeneration of axons beyond the injury site. There's a few sprouts, but it's, it's very little. So now we can ask, what happens if we use, instead of wild type mice, we use mice which lack one or several of these gross inhibitory receptors? Are these inhibitory receptors really important? for blocking regeneration, not on an inhibitory substrate in vitro, but actually in a real life situation in vivo, where we know there's like myelin inhibitors, there's probably semaphorins, natrins, efferins, CSPGs, and many other things we poss possibly don't even know yet about. And so in order for this to work, we obviously had to make sure that a lot of things would fall in place, and one of which is that the NOGA receptors are expressed in the retinal ganglion cells because these are the output neurons which project into the optic nerve. And so this seems to be indeed the case. So this is an in situ hybridization of an adult mouse retina probed for mRNA expression of NGO1. And you see here the ganglion cell layer with the arrow. There's lots of NGO1 in these neurons. There's lots of NGO2 probably the most, and there's, there's definitely a significant amount of NGO3 in there as well. So all three NOGO receptors are expressed in, ret expressed in retinal ganglion cells, the neurons which give rise to the optic nerve. These signals are specific because if you do that in NGO1, 2, and 3 triple null tissue, none of these probes gives us any labels, so that pretty much nails it that this is really a specific NOGO receptor 1, 2, or 3 signal. And again, to my big surprise, these retinas, in spite of all this expression of receptors, they're totally normal. We, we can't find any difference. Like the uh, inner plexi layer here is performing or developing totally normal based on uh, calbindin or calretinin staining. Also, the Herx staining shows no morphological defects. The myelination in the optic nerve here shown by tolerating blue staining of cross sections. There's no difference in myelination between wild type and triple nulls. And even the projections of retinal ganglion cell axons to the superior colliculus in the wild type or the mutant from one eye, and this is the left eye, this is the right eye, and this is both eyes. It seems to really um, have no detectable deficits. So the NOGO receptors are likely not important for wiring the nervous system. And also here we looked at the uh, SCN, um, LGN, where you have the segregation from one eye and the other eye. So it seems to really fall in place independent of whether you have a wild type or an NOGO receptor, triple null mouse. So that's kind of boring from a developmental point of view, but it's very good news for us for the regeneration study because if the mouse seems to wire and look almost wild type like, or we cannot detect a difference. So if you find a regeneration phenotype, it's likely not due to some malformation or changes that happened during development. So a problem of optic nerve regeneration studies, which um, is described here is that if you crush the optic nerve in a mouse or in a rat and probably in other mammal, after a few days you get rapid cell death. So any potential regeneration phenotype in NOGO receptor triple null mice could be due to changes in cell viability caused by loss of these three receptors. So we actually went in there and quantified the density of retinal ganglion cells before the injury in cross sections here by standing for a TUJ1, a neuronal marker. It's comparable, but more importantly, if you look after crush, I think this is seven days after crush, there's a lot of cell death, but the cell death is the same in the wild type and the triple null mice, so that's not a confounding effect. And then again, here is actually the peak of cell death is around three days, so this is activated caspase three. It rapidly peaks and then peters out after the first week, but that kills up to like 60 or 70 percent of all retinal ganglion cells. So we're actually only dealing with about 30 or 40 percent of retinal ganglion cells when we look at regeneration. But the point I want to make here, 
there is cell deaths in mild type of mutants, and the kinetics of the cell deaths is very comparable. So any regeneration phenotype is likely not secondary to a, a viability or, or change in cell death phenotype. And again, here is the injury. And then another experiment we kind of were excited about that it came out positively was that if we take optic nerve sections from wild type uninjured mice and ask are there proteoglycans there which we could detect with soluble receptors, we see very little proteoglycan expression <coughs> in these optic nerve sections. But if we injure the nerve, we see this huge upregulation of a binding activity, which is chase ABC sensitive for NGO1 and NGO3, which tells us that endogenously expressed chondritin sulfate proteoglycans induced by injury to the optic nerve are supporting binding of the nogoreceptor 1 and nogoreceptor 3. They do not bind nogoreceptors which selectively lack the proteoglycan binding amino acids, here for NGO1 and here for NGO3, and so this is quantified here. So the point I want to make here is if you injure the optic nerve, CSBGs are upregulated, that has been known, but these CSBGs bind nogoreceptor 1 and nogoreceptor 3 in a chase ABC dependent manner. So suggesting that the proteoglycans there can indeed interact with our receptor. And so here, that's the experiment which we all were waiting for, which is basically using triple knockout mice, crushing the optic nerve, then wait for two weeks and then count the fibers which grow here past the injury site by using a GAP-43 staining with an antibody which we uh, obtained from Larry Benowitz. And so this slide is basically assessing extrinsic mechanisms of growth inhibition. So what we find is that in a wild type mouse, you basically do not get any fibers which sprout beyond the injury site. In an ogoreceptor triple null mouse, you get many fibers, some of which are here, which sprout beyond the injury site. That's blown up here. You can see some of these gap 43 positive fibers. Then if you actually make a compound mouse where you also knock out RTPT sigma, which is another receptor, for CSBG, so you get still further regeneration here at uh, 0 0.2 millimeters, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, or 1 millimeter distal of the injury side. And this is the blow up. This is the triple null, and this is with sigma. And so <coughs> the point is even if you knock out multiple ligands and multiple receptors <coughs> in the optic nerve and do these regeneration studies, the regeneration that you see is actually very disappointing. You see, a few hundred fibers, which is not a lot if you think that there are about 50,000 axons in the optic nerve in a mouse. So that's probably some proof that there's some degree of released inhibition if you knock out all these receptors or even add another receptor which has been implicated in CSBG inhibition. But overall, it's still, it's disappointing given the number of fibers that are in the optic nerve and the numbers of fibers that we see that regenerate. So we, wanted to do better, and so we asked, can we combine our genetic approach with an approach which has been pioneered by Larry Benowitz, which is basically to induce locally an inflammation in the eye with cymosin, which then activates RGCs into a growth promoting state and leads to some degree of regeneration or, or regenerative external outgrowth. What happens if we use that paradigm and on top of that actually knock out our inhibitory ligand receptor systems. And so then things start to become much more interesting. So if we inject cymosin here into the eye a few hours after the optic nerve crush and wait for two weeks, we get a lot of axons which sprout beyond the injury side. And that's actually much more axons that you would see if you just knock out all three nogoreceptors or nogoreceptors plus RTPT sigma. So that's quantified here. But now if you combine our cymosin approach with the genetics, lose all three nogoreceptors, or lose the nogoreceptors plus RTPT sigma, at a significant distance from the injuries that we start to see a lot of fibers, and now we're talking about thousands of fibers in the optic nerve, and that's again quantified here. So the best regeneration we get 
if you use cymosin, knock out the two CSPG receptors which belong to the NOGO receptor family, and on top of that, knock out RTPT sigma. So now you get massive axonal growth which goes way beyond the injury side. Actually, these axons, if you let them grow for several weeks, they grow all the way back to the optic chiasm. So they keep on going. So we have done most of the quantification at two weeks, but if you, if you wait longer, these axons in an adult injured mammalian CNS grow for millimeters all the way to the optic chiasm. And obviously the long-term goal would be to like restore visual function. So we actually are doing now experiments where we take these nerves, rip them out of the animal, and shoot currents here at one side and then ask, can we record what's coming out here on the other side? And so what we see is there's slow propagating action potentials going through the nerve, most likely indicating that uh, these fibers are not myelinated. Um, they the active target those Well, the first target uh, that they would hit is actually the thalamus, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And there's a paper from Larry Benovich which shows that there's um, a circadian rhythm restored at least partially in these mice, suggesting that there are axons which go at least to the base of the thalamus and seem to hit some of the proper targets. But the end goal is actually to get them all the way back to the LGN and the superior colliculus and basically do um, visual, you know, cute driven experiments to actually show that they are regaining their vision. And so that's, I think we are excited about that we can get axons to grow, which still is another trivial task in an injured adult mammalian CNS. But if you get these axons to grow even better or even more in numbers, and we can guide them to the right target, I think there's a real hope here that we actually can restore function. And because these are CNS axons, any findings here might potentially be relevant for other CNS injuries as well. So, so to kind of summarize here, so we have been talking about NOGO, MAG, and OMGP. We have been talking about chondrin sulfate proteoglycans. They have receptors such as RTPT sigma. Here are the myelin inhibitory receptors. This is the known ligand receptor interaction for CSPGs. This is published from Mark Tessiovini and, and Steven Strittmatter that um, these inhibitors bind to NGO1 and PIRB. We have published the MAG interaction with NGR2. We haven't discussed that today. There's also NGR3, which had so far no ligand. And so what the story of today was about is that we have found this new connection between inhibitory CSPGs and the NOGO receptor 3 and NOGO receptor 1. NOGO receptor 2 does not bind to CSPGs. So basically the, the key finding here is that the NOGO receptor 1 and NOGO receptor 3 are novel CSPG receptors. And so there was this notion in the beginning, so we have the myelin camp and we have the glial scar CSPG camp. They're probably both right and they're probably not working in that different problems because at least at the molecular level, there's definitely a connection between these two ligand uh, receptor systems. So in the last two, three minutes, I just wanna you know, highlight a problem which is obviously coming up from all these studies and I haven't really paid attention to it too much is it is bad news that we can knock out all the known myelin inhibitors and play neurons on myelin and still get an awful lot of inhibition. So that means that these classical myelin inhibitory receptors, they might be necessary for some aspects of inhibition, such as growth cone collapse, but they're definitely not sufficient if you remove them to restore neuroid outgrowth. So to make a complicated story even more complicated, there must be still other yet unidentified uh, receptors for myelin on neurons that tell them not to grow in the presence of you know, multiple inhibitors which are present in myelin. And so through an interaction or collaboration with Stephen Gonias at UCSD, we actually found that the low-density lipoprotein-related receptor, LRP1, 
binds with high affinity to degenerating myelin, and that this receptor is important for the uptake of myelin debris. And so the question became, so what in degenerating myelin is bound by these receptors that allows the myelin to be endocytosed? And sure enough, what this receptor bound is one of our friends, which is myelin-associated glycoprotein, which is a potent inhibitor of neuroid outgrowth. So if you express MAG on the surface of cost cells and then use fragments of the ectodomain of this really big receptor, you can see that it binds very strongly to MAG. And there's different domains in these receptors, all of which bind very strongly to MAG. They bind similarly strong to the soluble NOGO receptors, which were discovered previously uh, by straight matter and, and the NGR2 receptor in my lab. What is interesting is that MAG is a lectin, and the lectin activity of MAG is not necessary for neuron outgrowth inhibition but the interaction of the NOGO receptor seems to kind of depend on a non-essential amino acid which does not participate in neuronal outgrowth inhibition. However, this new receptor seems to bind to MAG independent of its lactin activity, which is important because the lactin activity is not part of the inhibitory MAG domains. And so this is still very much work in progress, so what I want to show you is we have found another MAG receptor, and so we're now trying to understand what's the contribution of this interaction in the diverse biology of MAG. One aspect of MAG biology includes outgrowth inhibition. Another aspect is uh, axon glia interaction and uh, neuroprotection. And so just to show that this interaction is real, it's not just some in vitro artifact, if you use brain extracts and immunoprecipitate with anti-MAG, we can actually pull down LRP in a Western blot. If you use um, LRP1 antibodies for IP, we can pull down MAG. So these interactions are real. They occur in the brain, in the endogenous brain. And so we're now carrying out neuroid outgrowth inhibition assays to basically block LRP1 and ask how does this compare to neuroid outgrowths of neurons which do not have lost or decreased LRP1 expression. So this is work ongoing, but it looks very promising because we found that if we release MAG expression on neurons, they grow much longer <coughs> neurites in the presence of MAG. And so obviously this is work to be continued, but uh, I want to summarize because of the interest of time. So what I've been talking about today is that we have basically identified two novel functional receptors for chondritin sulfate proteoglycans, which are NGM1 and NGR3. So this is the third or fourth members of receptors if you include RDPT sigma and LAR. And so the way we went about this, we basically showed that NGL1 and NGL3, but not NGL2, directly binds with high affinity to the sugar moieties of uh, specific CSPG gags. So it's like the CSC does bind, the CSD does bind, but CSA and CSC do not bind, and so on. So there's high specificity there. So then importantly, the combined loss of NGL1 and NGL3 leads to significant release of CSPG inhibition in vitro and leads to somewhat enhanced axonal regeneration in the optic nerve in vivo. But again, if you just remove the receptors, it's a relatively modest regeneration phenotype. And then in gross enabled retinal ganglion cells, which is just a nice way to say basic injected cymosin to trigger immune response, members of the NOGO receptor family um, negatively impact on the number of regenerating axons falling in. So if you combine an activation of an intrinsic growth program with the release of environmental inhibitory mechanisms, then you get robust outgrowth, much more than either treatment alone. And so kind of the take home message is that myelin associated inhibitors like NOGO, MAG, and OMGP and CSPGs employ overlapping yet distinct members of the NOGO receptor family to signal neuronal growth inhibition. So again, this is the NOGO receptor that's where it binds NOGO, MAG, and OMGP. And so these here are the motifs which bind to CSPGs and also HSPGs, which I've not been talking about today, but it's something we're very interested in understanding whether actually HSPGs can compete here with CSPGs and change the inhibitory response. And so this is the most important slide. Uh, so MAB lab members, so Travis Dickendasher was pioneering most of the work um, on the identification functional characterization of the NGR1-NGR3 interaction with uh, CSPGs. 
Uh, he got uh, great assistance from uh, uh, Kate Baldwin on the optic nerve regeneration studies. Um, if Genia Miranova was helping with the neuroid outgrowth assays with compound mutants on CSPGs. Um, and we got a lot of reagents from numerous collaborators. Larry Benowitz helped us with setting up the optic nerve crush injury model. And Herb Geller at the NIH did the ELISA assays to basically show which CSKX do bind to the specific types of NOGO receptors and CSPGs. And we had some funding. Thank you. So in the, in the, opt, in, in the PNS, actually, there's one cells that they differentiate and become more immature and then eventually will release growth factors and start to differentiate and myelinate um, axons, sensory and motor and so on. In the optic nerve, if you crush the nerve, one of the first things that happens is that oligodendrocytes, which were along the distal stump of the axons, they basically disintegrate. They're basically, the myelin sheets fall apart, and all the inhibitors associated with these myelin sheets, prominently no-go mag and OMGP, they basically sit there. And, and there's no clearance. That myelin is protracted clear, is cleared in a protracted way. So it sits there for weeks or months. And actually, in spinal cord injured humans, you can actually see myelin degeneration products like years after the spinal cord injury. So these inhibitors just sit there. But that's just one part of the story. Then you have like reactive gliosis, lots of CSPGs actually upregulated all along the nerve, which was pretty amazing. And so it's just this highly inhibitory milieu, which really does give axons of the optic nerve no chance to extend beyond the injury site. If you, uh, if you look inside the cell with all these different inhibitory receptors, are there common changes that occur that make sense that they all end up doing the same thing, which is inhibiting output? Oh, it's, 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 I mean, there are some fragments. Or we know, for instance, that interaction between these ligands and receptors leads to the activation of row A. It leads to the activation of PKCs. We do not know, for instance, how the no-go receptors signal across the cell membrane in different cell types. In some cell types, this might be dependent on P75 or Troy. But we have shown that if you take knockout mice and test some of these knockout neurons, there still must be other mechanisms in there, because even in the absence of P75 and Troy, you can get growth cone collapse. So we do not exactly know what's immediately underneath the membrane, but we know that one of the intermediate products is row A and PKC, and eventually that converges to like break down the actin and the tubule inside the skeleton. And that's actually the same for CSPGs. It's not just for mild inhibitors. So like PKC and row A are both activated in the presence of CSPGs, and they're both activated in the presence of myelin, crude myelin, or individual myelin inhibitors. And there's, there's, there's other intermediates, but these are some of the main players. So, heparin sulfate triggers ligands actually promote growth. And Flanagan's second paper shows a molecular clustering of RPT sigma controls that. You have binding a CSPG and HSPG to no go receptor. Do you have the same molecular? We're, we're looking into that very much. So one of the experiments we're now doing is to use a constant amount of CSPG to get neuroid outgrowth inhibition and then start to add increasing doses of uh, HSPGs and then do that in the presence or absence of NGO1 and NGO3 so we could really see if there's a change whether it's driven by these two receptors. But yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. But it is probably that many of these proteoglycan binding receptors, they can bind CSPGs and HSPGs. So it's going to be interesting, you know, what's the implication of these different proteoglycan interactions. And a few years ago, we actually showed that if you use class 5 semaphorins and thalamic neurons, and you basically have a semaphorin 5A substrate, 
in the presence of HSPGs and SEMA 5 you get a, a very robust outgrowth promotion. But if you use semaphorin 5A and CSPG, the complex is actually inhibitory, much more than either individual component alone. So it, it's basically the same as the Flanagan or Riescu paper, where you have in the presence of HSPGs and X, you can promote growth, but in the presence of CSPG and X, you can inhibit growth. Yeah. Uh, you know, you <coughs> this, uh, like are produced by other cells that are not your own, like the uh, or blood cells. The, the, the myelin inhibitors? Yeah, we're actually very interested in uh, the observation that myelin inhibitors are, as the names as produced by myelin, by oligodendrocytes, much less in the peripheral nervous system except MAC, but they're also pr produced heavily by neurons and they're actually found enriched at synapses. And a few years ago, we showed that actually these molecules, these ligands and receptors at the synapse, for instance, the hippocampus at the CA1, CA3 synapse, they can actually regulate synaptic strength and synaptic potentiation. So that kind of brings me back to the original question. So why does everybody in here have NOGO receptor 1, 2, and 3, and NOGO and OMG and MAG in their brain? So there's, just, there's a good reason for that. And so we think at least in part, this could be to regulate synaptic plasticity, not only structurally, but also the strengths with which synapses can communicate, because that can be demonstrated very nicely um, in acute slices or in, in dissociated neurons. So you get structural changes, but you also have changes that affect synaptic strengths. And so that's been shown by um, Martin Corte, Martin Schwab's lab, and our lab. And I think this is kind of a new trend where the field might go to actually understand what's the physiology of these molecules in a healthy or naive brain which has not been injured. Yeah. Because <coughs> uh, it looks like this inhibitory mechanism is very, very strong, yeah. very redundant. Yeah. So, did you interpret the regeneration of this nerve? what the city is trying to do is that the neuron has to reach the target to, to actually the cell to survive and be in contact with the target. So have you tried to put like NGA, NGF or that kind of growth factor that are provided by the target mm -hmm. to see the that in the peripheral nervous system, I mean, there is the neurotrophic theory that you need to have target-derived neurotrophic factors to survive. Actually, in spinal cord injury, if you, for instance, cut the corticospinal tract, many neurons in the motor cortex, they survive for years, for decades. They get atrophic, because they're probably not very active, but it's not that the neuron, it's not a primarily a neuronal cell death problem, it's really a wiring problem to actually reconnect. And, and, and reconnection can happen with many different ways. The easiest way is like you have axons caught here and you just grow these axons and they want to reach their final target again. But maybe you actually can use spared axons which are in the neighborhood to basically sprout collaterals, basically latch on on these axons that make relays. And I think that's a much more attractive way to actually repair an injured spinal cord than actually the noble regrowth of like 10 or 20 or 30 centimeters of axons. That's going to be very challenging, especially for a, a tall person like Christopher Reeve with a very high cervical injury. I mean, there would have been a lot of axonal growth to get him his hind limb movement back, for instance. So, so, so maybe there are relays that can be formed. Because in many spinal cord injured patients which are completely paralyzed, if you look at the spinal cord, there's still white matter with a significant number of, of, of spared axons that just blocked but they're there physically. So if you somehow could harness these axons, I think that would be a very attractive way to actually get some function back. Yeah, I'm very uh, interested in the, the observation you made about myelin. I mean, so far it seems like you're, you're not getting remyelination, at least your physiology suggests there's not, and I don't know if you look morphologically, but it's interesting in rodents that you can get remyelination, you know, EAE models of, of demyelination, but yet, uh, in regeneration, you have axons for a long time in an area that's rich in, in precursor cells and yet no myelin. Can, can you, uh, do you know what? Any speculation? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. So these, most of these regeneration studies were actually done in black six mice. And so if you do EAE in black six mice, they actually get a chronic progressive form of MS. So they basically get worse over time. It's not like uh, remitting, relapsing. But I don't know whether this is playing into this particular paradigm here. 
what is interesting, and that's work from Larry Benowitz, if he uses cymosin, he has shown that he gets at least anatomically based on the EM level some degree of myelination of regenerating axons. That's something we're very interested in actually looking at more carefully in nocle receptor compound mutants combined with cymosin because we get more growth there. And so the question then is, is this growth actually supported by myelinating axons, like by axon myelination? But of course, it's a huge problem. I mean, growing axons, that's like, that's like the first step, that's the first baby step of re restoring a nervous system. I mean, you have to wire these axons to the right targets. You have to make synapses. These synapses have to be trained, probably in an experience-dependent manner. You probably have to prune the synapses away, which are not on the right target. You have to myelinate these axons and so on. I mean, you have to build sodium channel clusters at the nodes. There's a lot of things which have to fall in place to get this repaired. The good news is that there's some intrinsic um, mechanisms which allow the system to operate fairly well, even if the regeneration is not complete. So you don't need to get 100% of the axons back. You don't need to have 100% myelination. You can still get a significant uh, portion of function back. And that's true for most organs. I mean, you don't need you know, 100% of your liver to function properly, and you need only one kidney instilled. So again, the goal is to get more axons to the right place and hopefully myelinate as many of them as you can. But myelination is only a problem once you get axons to grow, and we're kind of happy we're, at, we're now solving that problem.